the title of my talk. Uh, you're right, this talk really isn't about you. Uh, I'm going to be talking about one of the biggest zero days in the world that no one really likes to talk about uh, and uh, what we're doing about it. But it's sort of it's like a, a joke on uh, communication. Uh, and that's that first comic says, your big project is running late, what can you do? And the guy's like, people are already flat out uh, conference calls morning and night, 60 emails a day, an hour, uh, half hour time in meetings. I don't see what else we can do. Uh, what do you think is the real problem? And he says, I think it's a lack of communication. Really? It's like, uh, so that's going to be the whole thing. That's like, um, the, that's going to be the whole theme through this is communication. Uh, this is uh, basically a little bit about me. I don't, uh, the thing you need to know is that I do a lot of break in. It's like uh, I've done one on National Geographic, it's like news, and, but I like robbing people. And that's one on one that's good for patching humans on a one on one basis. So for the last year, I decided to try to expand that and try to do more security awareness for enterprises. And that's one of the main things I'm focusing on. And you're going to see that a little bit about in this talk. Uh, but when we talk about communication, we also have to talk about how our message is translated. Uh, this are, these are two famous quotes by John F. Kennedy, uh, an American president that everybody, and this first one on the left, everybody likes to talk about this one. Everybody loves to like talk about how intelligent that sounds and inspiring, and, and it's like it's just a great quote. When written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger, and the other represents opportunity. That sounds really nice. You know, you usually see that on a poster with a lake or a little bird flying over it and stuff, you know, with clouds. It's like, it's very inspirational, right? It's wrong. Completely, utterly wrong. It's like, that is not, crisis in uh, Chinese is not danger and opportunity, the two words can do. It's like, I gave uh, uh, this slide up, but as soon as I put this slide up when I was giving this talk, uh, talk like this in Shenzhen, everybody started laughing immediately. It's like, because they knew exactly that that was incorrect. Um, but we give him credit for that. He is still quoted to this day as saying a factual statement that that was a factual statement and that was correct. And it's like, and people still use it and still people try to inspire people with that, with that quote. It's like, but he was wrong. And that is a wrong quote that we're perpetrating on that. The second one is the famous Ich bin ein Berliner. You know, it's like Lucas is from Berlin. It's like he'll probably say that I didn't say that properly. But still, you get the gist. He was made fun of ruthlessly for this statement because he was said and reported in the press that what he was talking about was a Berliner is a donut. That's famous in Berlin. So he was, everybody made fun of him because he, was, he basically told the world, I am a jelly donut. And that's hilarious, right? But it's 100% wrong. He actually, if you're from the city of Berlin, the proper usage of the word to say, Ich bin ein Berliner, is saying, I'm one with Berlin. I am one from the city. So he was actually saying a truthful statement. And to this day, he is ridiculed for that statement, though he was correct. So one, the, only, the two main quotes, one that he got terribly wrong and we still give him credit for, and the other one we ruthlessly mock at him and he was uh, totally correct on. So like we have a problem when we get the message out versus how we communicate. Um, and let's talk about zero days. You're going to be at this conference, you're going to hear about a lot of zero days, a lot of uh, technical talks. Don't worry, this isn't one of them. Uh, but it's like uh, I am going to be talking about a zero day that we don't talk about very often. It's like, and what is, a, what is the definition of a zero day? A vulnerability that's been discovered but not patched, correct? We can all agree on that's the, the, a zero day. It's like a, a vulnerability that's been discovered and not patched. So let's face it, the biggest zero day facing our industry is what? People. Humans are the biggest zero day. They have not been patched. They're they still out there. They are still vulnerable. And what have we done to, to try to fix that? Well, that's a hard problem. We can fix, you know, like the technical problems. So let's just ridicule that problem. It's like it's better to just put it all out on the user and make fun of them instead of actually trying to fix that zero day. It's like finding a, a gaping uh, hole in, in Microsoft, which is, you know, pretty easy. It's like or, or Linux has got one going on right now. It's like finding these and just laughing it off and saying that's going to make it better. Doesn't really make it better, does it? Does it make your systems less compromised? If you don't pass for MS0867 or MS1810 uh, 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 or 1710, you're going to have a bad day, right? It's like it does, does, all the laughing in the world is not going to make your system uh, more secure. But we laugh about the human errors all the time. 
uh, with this joke saying, in this corner we have firewalls, encryption, antivirus, software, etc. And in this corner we have Dave, human error. I hate this cartoon. I hate it so much that I complained to my supervising adult, you know, the, my business manager, about how much I hated this cartoon. So do you know what he did? He went and contacted the artist of this cartoon. And we actually paid him to fix it. This is the way the cartoon should be. If you don't think that's the proper way for this cartoon to be, then you're part of the problem. It's like this should be what you rely on. We keep trying to get technology to solve our human problems instead of getting humans to help with our technology problem. We've, I don't care how many blinky boxes you, you buy, and I'm sorry for blinky box vendor, vendors that are in the room, but it's like that's not going to solve your problems. Until we start addressing the root cause of a lot of our issues, which are people and how they deal with the issues, we're still going to keep getting compromised. It's like technology should augment the human. It should be an added layer of defense. It's not the solution. It never will be the solution. It's like, so we have to address that. And one of the things that people tell me the most about is like, yeah, but how do we get users to, to, to get involved in it? It's like, you know, that's not part of their job. It's like, they don't want to do those kind of things that'll make them more secure, you know, study links, or it's like, or uh, not fought for spear phishing. It's like, or, or scanned uh, devices before they plug them into their machines or gets, they don't want to do those things. And I'm like, are you serious? Do you know what people will do for money? People will do what's required of them to keep their job. This was a job. It's not really a job I'm particularly careful, uh, you know, uh, uh, excited about, you know, but it's like it was a job. It paid money. People will do what is required of them to stay employed. Our problem is we're not requiring them to be secure. We're adding it as an add-on. We're adding it as like, oh, well, you also need to do this. And there's no repercussions when they do it wrong. No one gets anything bad if something uh, goes wrong. It's like we're not giving them any repercussions, no consequences. It's usually just a slap on the wrist. We have to understand that every employee, if they understand that their job responsibility is information security and that their job require, to be employed requires that, they will do it. They won't go above and beyond. No one goes above and beyond what they're supposed to do. Right? It's like, if I'm not going to get in trouble for not doing something security, then I don't need to do it. I mean, I literally Googled excited worker, and all I found were stock photos. I couldn't even find a real excited worker. And I guarantee you, after every single one of these people took this picture of being an excited worker, as soon as that picture was over, like, oh, God, I hate this job. You know? <laughs> it's like, you couldn't even find a real stock. I mean, it's, that's just the way it is. No one is going to do more above and beyond what is required of them if there's no negative repercussions from it. If they don't have anything negative happening to them for not doing a secure job, why bother? I have all these other deadlines. I have all these other tasks. It's like, I mean, do we really look at that? We, we tell coders, it's like code securely. You know, security loves to talk about the coders, right? Oh my gosh, developers, it's like they, they don't even know how to code securely. They don't know how to, to take time to actually. When do they get a chance? Every, every developer usually gets a project and stuff. You know, it's like, here's the project. It's like it was due three weeks ago. And then we tell them, oh, but make sure it's securely coded. Make sure you go and you double check. Make sure there's no holes in it. Make sure there's no vulnerabilities, but we need that by five. And you get it at noon, right? It's like not reasonable. It's like, so they're not, if we don't say that this is a requirement and willing to give them the time to actually, and the, the uh, instructions to do that, they're not going to do it. One of the things I talk about is trying to educate the, uh, the user by giving them actual analogies that they can comprehend. And so one of the ones that I like to use is uh, a delivery driver. You have delivery drivers here, correct? It's like, and uh, you, uh, the companies will give them a vehicle. It's like, it can be an expensive vehicle, you know, like a really good van. It's like, do you, as, soon as, the, that, as soon as that starts, it's like as soon as you, the first day on the job of the delivery driver, you go and you tell them, hey, it's like, by the way, uh, you got the job, so we know you know what you're doing, so here are the keys, here's your delivery route, have fun, we'll see you back at five. No. 
that's a that's an important piece of equipment that costs like you know fifty thousand dollars it's like you tell them it's like uh you need to make sure that you're using your seat belt you have to use turn signals these are the speed limits this is how you operate our vehicle it's like you need to go through a test to make sure that you drive correctly and safely uh there's a number on the back of the vehicle in, in case you drive recklessly we can be you can get reported we put a gps tracker in the unit to make sure you're not going over the speed limit we take a lot of time to make sure that that delivery driver is not going to screw up that's a and a very expensive piece of equipment, $50,000. First day of the job of someone that's working in computers, you tell them it's like uh, with a computer, all you do is you tell them like how to do the numbers, how to, how to make the widgets, how to market the widgets. But on the security of the vehicle, uh, on the computer, not so much. But when they fall for a spearfish and they cost your company $300 million, you go, oops, that was bad. A, an employee can lose millions of dollars from a computer or a delivery driver can lose $50,000 from a van by having an accident. Which one gets more repercussions if they make that mistake? A delivery driver. How many times can a delivery driver wreck a van and still be employed? It's like one, maybe two, but in a person that goes and keeps on clicking on spear phishing emails, or they keep uh, downloading viruses on their system, how long do they get to keep being employed? This is one of my main things that I talk about that's very unpopular. But I am telling you, if an employee is constantly being a security risk, if they keep clicking on a link in emails willy-nilly, if they keep going and uh, downloading viruses, after the second, third, or fourth time, terminate them. They should be fired. They're jeopardizing the security of your company. Why are you still letting them be employed? You don't let a delivery driver keep wrecking your van. Why do you let a uh, worker keep jeopardizing your network? Because there's no consequences for online actions. It's like I, I did something really funny a while back. It's like, and I, and I talk about it. It's like we have a problem understanding the consequences online and, and putting it into the real world effect, right? I play, I just, uh, who started playing Call of Duty? The new one, not the sucky old one. It's like the new Call of Duty with Activision. I'm the only guy playing Call of Duty here. Okay, you're lying. It's like, uh, but it's like, you know, like first person shooters, it's like, you know, or, or you know, PUBG. It's like, you know, you get these games and you, when I play Call of Duty, I love first person shooters because I can just go in and just start shooting, right? It's like, I don't do any of the teamwork stuff. You know, it's like, I, I play Team Deathmatch, they hate me because they're all trying to be like all sneaky and like, you know, like a military unit. And I'm like, YOLO, pew, 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 America. You know, it's like, I'm just running and gunning, shooting down the car and it's like, pew, pew, pew. It's like, I die and I'm like, oh, well, I respawn. I start shooting again, pew, 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 America. But guess what happens? If you put electrodes on my body, that every time I got shot in the game, I got a shock. Would I be fire? Would I be playing that way? No, I'd be like, pew pew, America. It's like, it's like I don't want to get shot. There's online reper there's repercussions in the real world for what happened online. I don't want that to happen. We need to start explaining to our employees that there are real world consequences for what they do on uh, in virtual in the, the virtual world. It's like they need to understand that. Because they don't. They don't understand that. We have to make sure that they understand that those consequences exist. It's like you can actually uh, YouTube uh, adorable kids caught by dad after painting themselves. And it's a great show on how not to take responsibility for your actions. It's like, you know, because when an employee gets caught opening up a link or downloading a file, is it ever their fault? Is it ever like, oh, I flagrantly disregarded security policy and I clicked on that link when I know I shouldn't have, that was totally my bad. No, it was security failed us this way, the technology wasn't in place to protect us from here, it's like, or uh, I wasn't properly educated on, on what the process was. But they're not taking responsibility for their actions and is that really their fault about not taking responsibility? Which is funny because it's not, their fault for taking responsibility for the stuff that they're responsible for. It's our fault for not explaining to them and letting them know that they have to be responsible for those actions. We have to put it back on them. We have to let them know and let them understand what security policies are and how they're supposed to be part of that. How many people know how to contact uh, information security if they see a suspicious email? 
or if they see a, uh, a person in the facility they're not supposed to be in. How many people, do you have an extension number for everybody to call? Do you have an email address for everybody to forward to it? If you don't, how is that their fault? If, they don't, if you're not empowering and educating your employees on how to be part of the security team, you can't be upset when they're not part of your security team. You have to give them that, you have to arm them with those things and then give them that responsibility of it. It's like, but we like to just offset it on them and just make it that they're the scapegoats. But that's not the case. And I love this, this just happened a week or so ago. This was actually from uh, the White House. Kanye West, as everybody realized, Kanye West's passcode was 000000. Which, you know, you make fun of it because it's six zeros. It's like, that's a lousy password. Well, I, you also have to remember back in the 1980s, the U.S. nuclear launch code's default passcode was 000000000. 000. It was nine, so it was a little bit more secure, right? It's like, it was like the U.S. nuclear passcodes were only three zeros more secure than Kanye's iPhone, okay? So let that sink in for a second when we talk about security and responsibilities. And thank God we didn't die. Um, but so I like this one. I pwn all the things. I like his tweet the most because it, he talks about lots of folks will laugh at this, but I think it's a useful illustration of how security features fail when security decisions get offloaded to users who see them as annoying obstacles. If you're not educating your users on why these are important, it's not just because security says so. It's not just because security is, says this is the way to do it. If you're not actually talking to them about the risk and why it's important and why they have to follow these guidelines, then they're gonna find a way around it. It's like, you know, one of the things I hate the worst is the word uh, stupid user. You know, stupid user clicked on a link. Stupid user went to a website. I go stupid information security didn't properly train their user. It's like, if you think users are stupid, do me a favor. Uninstall Solitaire from your machine. See how quickly that comes back, okay? If you want to put a policy in there saying that you, you'll, through the GPO, that you take Solitaire off the, see how quickly it comes back. People will be very inventive when you take things away that they like. I was literally at a, a hacker meeting, a, a DEF CON groups meeting in Dallas one time, and there was a guy from an insurance company there. He did not blend well, okay? <laughs> it's like, and he was there. You know why he was there? because his company had just instituted a proxy that disabled Facebook from the desktop, and he was trying to, he, was, he Googled and looked for hackers so he could find a way to circumvent the proxy to get back to Facebook. That's some time. It's like, that's effort. It's like, why not the phone? I mean, come on, the mobile app's not that bad, right? It's like, but that's what he did. It's like, so users will be inventive. They will do these things. They're not unintelligent. It's like they have a job. They're employed for a reason. It's like we have to educate them on what they need to do to be better secured. Uh, oh, and I have a confession to make, um, which is uh, this isn't really a regular keynote rant kind of thing. Uh, it's a group panel, and y'all are the, the panelists. So uh, I'm going to ask you a question now. And one of you in the audience, or two or three, are going to answer the question. But don't worry, if no one wants to answer the question, I'm going to run into the audience and randomly pick one of you. <laughs> okay? And, 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 and trust me, you in the back, I go there first. Okay? <laughs> so that's not, that's not saving you. It's like, I need the exercise. So I will run back there and ask you first. So here's the, our first question. It's like, what is our biggest challenge in InfoSec when it comes to users? And, uh, oh... Also, I have a translator, so you don't have to worry about uh, uh, not being able to say, well, I don't know how to say it in English. That's okay. Uh, I'll listen this way. So who wants to answer that question? Y'all going to make me start off right off the bat running? We can do this. <laughs> Someone's going to raise their hand? Yes, someone raised his hand. Did you raise your hand? I'm going to pick you anyway. Okay, here, here we go. Hold on. Here we go. So, what is your biggest challenge in InfoSec when it comes to users? Ensiná-los a como identificar os links que eles não devem clicar, por exemplo. How do we actually help technology to uh, modify? Oh, I forgot. You also get speak, uh, stickers. He's like, you should have said off that right off the bat, Jason. It's like I would have answered the question. There you go. Um, so, one of the things is how are we getting technology to properly do that? It's like how do we augment it? It's like one of the biggest challenges is 
Our technology augmenting the help of the users. We want them to identify links and emails. But how can they do that when there's actually JavaScripts that actually obfuscate what the link looks like until they click it? So yeah, technology has to be there. We have to use technology, but we have to use it in a way that augments the users. One of the things that I say that we do is on your, a lot of people are using Exchange servers. Do you know there's an option in Exchange server that says any external email that comes in, you can add uh, something in the subject line or the body of the message that says, warning, external email. It's ugly. It's like, we just had it implemented in one of the companies that I work with. They hate it. All the employees hate it. But you know what they don't hate? They don't hate having a CEO email coming in, telling them to buy them $3,000 worth of iTunes gift cards because it comes from the CEO and then actually buying into that because they didn't check the email header to see who it was. As soon as you see warning coming from an external email source, you know that it wasn't from your CEO. You instantly know that's not going to work. So there are ways that we can use to help obfuscate, to, to, to uh, augment um, uh, what these source, uh, sources are. It's like you can do that. It's like we can use technology to do that. But we have to make sure that we are under, we're talking to the users and explaining to them what those technologies are, are for and what they're in place for and how they are not 100% correct. It's like there's no technology that's going to 100% fix the problem of anything. So we need to make sure that the users know that that's there, that helps augment their, their decisions, but it's not going to offset the responsibility of clicking on the links. Anybody else have an answer? Now that they know I have, st oh, now that they know I have stickers, it's like, yeah, they're all over the place. Okay, yeah, just a second. Okay, I'll go here and there. <coughs> Oops, I don't have my, do you speak English? Okay, thank goodness, because I forgot the translator thingy. There you go. To make them understand the importance of a strong password is the most difficult thing. Oh, that's a good one. It's like uh, one of the key things is like password and password reuse. Uh, one of the things I talk about um, when I do security awareness classes is uh, I tell people, stop using passwords. It's like, uh, stop using them. And they're like, it's like, Jason, it's like, stop using passwords. It's like, I thought that was a good thing. Don't get on Twitter that Jason says not to use passwords. Do you know that the space bar is actually a valid character in your network logins and most web applications? The space bar. So stop writing passwords and start writing passphrases. It's like, use the space, use the proper punctuation like I'm or I've or you've or would have or could have or didn't or can't. It's like, that's got the apostrophe in there and then the space and an exclamation point at the end. Substitute one, one letter for a number and you've got an almost unbreakable passphrase. It's like, I mean, and you can, you can reuse, you don't have to reuse them on different sites. Come up with different movie quotes or song lyrics. You know, a good movie quote is a great way to, to, to remember uh, your, your web password. I mean, you know, you got to, I'm, I'm, I'll be back or get to the chopper. Don't use Schwarzenegger quotes, they're too short. Uh, but, uh, but you know, there's other movie quotes that you can use that it's like will help you do that. Uh, I'm gonna get you on the next one, sorry. It's like, here we go. So the next question is, how do we engage users to be part of the security process and not part of the problem? How do, how do we engage users to be part of the security process and, and not part of the problem? How do we engage with them? How do we get them to be part of it? What's a good way? Oh, there's one in the very back. Okay. I, am getting, I should have had my Wheaties. Oh, no, I'll run. It's fine. It's like, raise your hand again. I can't see you now. Don't let me run back there for nothing. Okay. Yes. Okay, I believe in gamification as a learning process to users. Perfect. Yeah, and we actually, we'll, we'll, uh, he was talking about gamif gamification, which is really great. Can we have the answers up front next time? Thanks. Um, but yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about gamification in a little bit. That is a good point to do. One of our other problems is uh, ourselves. How many people here know how your company does business and makes money? I mean, the whole process from the beginning of the, are you sure we have 10 minutes? We can't stand yeah, I was going to say, because I started way late. <laughs> it's like, okay, I don't buy that. It's like, um, and I tell people the best example of not knowing what you're supposed to be doing 
uh, when you're supposed to be securing something is the TSA. So they're a great example of incompetence. And I shouldn't say that too much because I have to go back. But, uh, but literally, if you don't know how your company makes money, how can you protect it? Do you know what's important to them? I mean, and they may not realize what's important to them until it's gone or until it's uh, on ransomware or it got uh, uh, hacked or, or the database got stolen. So you need to make sure you're going through your company and finding out what's critical to them. Can they be out of uh, email communication from their clients for an hour or a day or a week? Do they need web presence to continue work? Is that important? Can they be down for five minutes to an hour or five seconds and that causes an interruption? It's like some companies, depending on what business they are, they have certain requirements in certain ways. They may not need an email automatically. They may not have a big web presence, so it's not important. It's like, where is the back end? What are the back end communication channels? It's like in your suppliers. Trust me, Target wish, wish they would have realized what their security risks were when they were talking about back end vendors, right? It was an HVAC company that got them not an actual intruder directly into their network. It was a third party representative, but they didn't realize all the different connections that were coming in, and that was their problem. Also, how do we communicate? It's like, uh, this is day five at the RSA conference. It's like, I like picking on RSA for some reason. Uh, no, I'm not paranoid after four days at an IT security conference. Who are you? Why are you asking me all these questions? You know? It's like, because we do, we have a problem with how we communicate. How, when we communicate to executives and users, how do we talk to them? We usually talk to them the way we talk to each other, and then we look at them like they're idiots. Can I tell you something? It's like there is no executive in the world that needs to learn the terminology that you use to do their job. It is part of your requirement as, uh, as a security professional to speak in terms that they understand readily. It's like, I don't care how amazing that not sled that you made, or you popped the shells, or you did whatever, if you talk in terminology that I don't understand, you wasted my time. How did I learn from that? I learned you're smart and you understand words and say words that I don't know, which makes me feel stupid. Usually a lot, especially at these hacker conferences, right? It's like, but still, that's what we need to start doing. You need to communicate in the way that an executive understands. Metrics, pie charts, everybody loves pie, right? It's like, you know, it's like pie charts, it's like numbers. Give them something concrete to go on. Explain it down. It's like not dumb it down. Explain it down so they understand what the threats are and how it relates to the risk of their company and the risk of the profits and how you're going to mitigate that risk. You have to talk in their term terminology. They don't have to talk in yours. So it would be nice if they did, wouldn't it? But it's not going to happen usually. So it's like you need to better communicate to your executives and to your users. Do your users see you as a threat? Or do they see you as a, an ally? It's like most time when people see uh, security, it's like it's not really a good thing, right? It's like, it's like, are we really going and trying to facilitate a communication between the users and security? Are we letting them know that I'm not just here to catch you surfing porn on the, on the company computer? I'm here to see if you're uh, secure. I'm here to help keep you employed and keep you having a job to make sure that we're still secure because if our job uh, is gone because of, uh, someone takes our database and steals our data, it's like we all lose our jobs. And you're partly responsible for that. You're helping keep the company secure, helps keep us employed. Are you communicating that to your users? If you're not teaching them that and showing them that you're not there just when they screw up, you're there to help them. Do lunch and learn sessions where you teach them how to secure their Wi-Fi at home. Teach them how to track their privacy settings on Facebook and social media. Teach them how to do these things and you start becoming an ally and then when they see something suspicious, they're more likely to come to you. It's like they probably see things that are shady and sketchy AF every single day. But they don't want to tell you because they don't want to deal with you. They don't want to look like they're in trouble. You have to change that look. So what is the biggest impediment you're facing in doing a more effective job? What's keeping you from doing a better job uh, in information security? What do you think that is? I still got stickers. Okay, here we go. Here we go. At least he's halfway, so that's good. Okay. 
I'm gonna have so much ice cream after this. It's awesome. Okay. Yes. As I say, the prejudice we have on the user always being dumb and don't know what the hell he's doing on the computer. This might be might be our biggest flaw. Okay. So. Oh, well, you can also well, take the sticker back too. No. Okay. So, um, so yeah, we we put unnecessary pressure on the user sometimes, where they feel. Like it's their responsibility to get the, uh, to be, like they're taking all the responsibility. You, be, you need to come as an ally. You need to show that they're there to augment, that they're part of the security team. If they don't realize they're part of the security team, they're never gonna act like it. It's like they'll see you as an outsider. They need to see you as a team member. You need to show them that you're part of the team. That's one of the biggest things to do. So uh, what is your, there you go. What is your biggest accomplishment as it relates to creating a more secure environment at work? I should get everybody's hand up. What's the best thing that you've done to create a better secure environment at work? Oh, yeah, hold on, he said something, so he volunteered. Hey. Thank you for being up front. So, so what's your answer? Show the consequences. Oh, so how do you show the consequences? Okay. Many ways. Uh, for example, uh, financial damages and uh, Network damages and so on. Perfect. It's like you show consequences. It's like there are so many wonderful examples of terribleness out there, right? Target, OPM, Experian. There are so many different. Oh, I don't need that anymore. Uh, there's so many wonderful examples you can show that show actual five, uh, financial damage. Whose company here in this room can stand withstand losing 300 million USD in one year and shake it off? Okay, what's your IP address and website, please? <laughs> oh, oh, no, okay, not so funny now. Okay, okay, good, good to know. It's like, yeah, not many people can do that, right? It's like, we have to do that. We have to show them what the risks are. There's a lot of examples of, of that. It's like, so you have to, you have to show them that. Now, also, um, how do we pro, uh, pro, approach the problem versus uh, users? Are we actually trying to, yeah, the, the comic says our devices are now 100% secure. He says, how did you do that? I turned them all off. <laughs> Is that the proper response? It's like, we need to understand, it's like you have to have technology to augment it. It's like you can't just, but you, and, and one thing that Ben 10 said, uh, in one of the talks that I recently saw, he says that your company should be able to survive a click. It's like your defenses should be able to survive a click. Do you have exfiltration uh, monitoring uh, on your firewalls? Are you monitoring when data goes out? I mean, Sony, let's face it, Sony's a major corporation, right, all over the world. They didn't notice 1.3 terabytes leaving their network? Seriously. I know, I know companies that will notice 100 megs leaving their network. 1.3 terabytes in that, oh, 1.3 terabytes going to Paraguay. Looks cool, sure, you know? That should, have, that should have raised some alarm bells. It's like, so we have to have the technology in there to augment, but we can't just rely on the humans to, to be the solution. And so, and how do we uh, do, take the risk and, and make it effective? It's like, how do we give them the signs? It's like, how do we, uh, how do we stop fail? Gamification, uh, like gentleman said at the back. We need to start gamifying security awareness. Can your company afford uh, 4,000 uh, reels a year? for better security. Every quarter, every three months, you have a drawing company-wide, and you get a 1,000 reel or a 10,000 reel uh, gift certificate to, a, uh, to like Starbucks or to wherever. It's like, or you get a, a prize or it's like, whatever, you get like, but it's a nice big prize. And it's only that price. It's like, you only have that much money to work with, so that's fine. But how do you get the, how do you get in, entered into the drawing? Every time you report a security incident, every time you see a suspicious email and you forward it to your information security team, every time you see someone suspicious walking, if you see someone walking behind you and trying to tailgate and you report that, they may be three entries. If it's just a suspicious email, you may just get one entry. It's like if you actually catch an actual real spearfish, that may be five entries. And you have to uh, play to pay, you know? It's like, it's like you have to be security conscious if you want to get a chance to win. 
They still don't care about your data, don't get me wrong, okay? They still don't care about your security, but now there's something in it for them. That's how you do it. You make them invested in trying to be more secure. It's like, and, and how do we constantly uh, deal with this, you know, constant uh, changing battlefield? It's like, how do we do this? It's like, we keep it interesting. We keep them engaged. It's like through monthly newsletters, through ways that we can keep talking to them, we keep them engaged in it. It's like, that's one of the things that we have to do. It's like, you can't just say, we've installed a security policy, we've uh, done a web browser where they have to take 10 questions, it's like, and then go, boom, it's like, uh, you answer that and you're, you, you've done your security awareness class. We've got to do more than that. It's like we've got to constantly engage them through monthly announcements. It's like a heads up. It's like whenever there's a when there's an iOS patch that came out for the iPhone or the iPad. It's like you know whatever iDevice. It's like send a company wide email out saying by the way there's a security patch out that you should update your phones. Let them realize that there's things that they need to take care of. It's like, uh, I mean, you don't do that for every patch. It's like, you know, it's like for Adobe, it would be like every five minutes you'd be sending out emails. But it's like, uh, no offense to Adobe people in the room, but it's like still, it's like that's what you do. It's like you send them out alerts when there's like a major, uh, when WannaCry was going on. It's like send out a, an executive letter to your executives letting them know what it was and what the repercussions were. It's like, I mean, that's a great teachable moment. It's like we have to you start using those. It's like to, to, to better our education of our users. We don't just say, oh, crap, that's bad to ourselves. Educate and talk out to your executives. Talk out to your users. Let them know why it was bad. Let them know why you would be susceptible to that if it hit you or why you're not susceptible to it because of the defenses that you put in. It's like give them those, that kind of information. Educate them on those things. And, oh, and I do have one confession. When I said the title of the talk was, you're right, this wasn't about you. Um, yeah, my bad. Um, it was about our industry. It's like our industry has to get better at communication. It's like, it doesn't matter how many zero days you patch. It's like how good your applications are secured. If you can still have a, a human who was just sent a link saying there's dancing gerbils on the other side of this warning box that says, do you want to go to this sketchy site, yes or no? Guess what? You lose. There's dancing gerbils on the other side, right? It's like we have to start communicating. We have to start creating a communication channel to our users if we want to be successful in this industry. It's like patching technology is not going to be enough. It's never been enough. It's like we just like to joke off and laugh it off, but it's not until we start patching the humans. And there is a patch for human stupidity. It's called education. And there it is. I'm done. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> I think we have uh, time for at least one or two questions if you want to question me now. It's like you put me on the spot.